get started. Good morning, welcome. A few quick announcements. Um, this evening, the Reformation series, we're going to be looking at, um, really, it's an inter it, well, it's sort of a conclusion to Luther's life. Um, at least some of the things that happened with regard to the uh, German Lutheran Reformation, and then he moves on to Calvin to talk about some of the, uh, well, great things that uh, the Lord did through Calvin. Uh, in Geneva, how he got him there and so forth. And as you know, I'm trying to tie the morning and evening together. So what I'd like to focus on is just how the Lord brought about this Reformation. You know, it, it, we, we talk a lot about prayer, and, and prayer is very important. But prayer without labor, prayer without action, isn't really going to produce anything. Uh, we, can, we can pray, uh, spend a lot of time praying that, for instance, the Lord would bring more people to the, uh, to the service, but unless we actually invite people, uh, we're likely not going to see any, any new faces unless they get reached by the radio or by, by the Internet. So the Lord would have us to pray, but He'd also have us to, to work uh, diligently. And let me just read what the, uh, the evening's uh, message is about. Uh, Godfrey, I believe Godfrey is the one who's writing these, um, uh, these uh, summaries because it does sound like um, you know, whoever's writing them understands <laughs> what the, the, uh, the lecture is actually about. Sometimes you don't get that impression when you read the study guides. But okay, he says, Perhaps there is no greater testimony to the enduring nature of Luther's reforms than the fact that the Reformation continued to gather strength after his death. As Lutheranism took firm root in Germany, other areas in Europe also became centers of vigorous reform. Not least of these was the Swiss city of Geneva, where the reform branch of Protestantism took shape under the persistent labors of William Farrell and John Calvin. And I think this is something we see that's in common between Luther and Calvin, is the fact that they so loved the Lord and desired for his gospel to be known to uh, to the people of uh, Europe, that they labored tirelessly. Uh, both of these men actually burned their lives out rather, relatively early. But that wasn't uncommon. Spurgeon did exactly the same thing. They did what they could, as much as they could, while they had strength. Uh, they just didn't happen to have very good uh, medical technology in, in those days. So anyway, uh, what we're looking at this morning is, is essentially that our Lord calls us to, to be this way, uh, to give ourselves to His work, to His kingdom, to doing what we can do for His glory, even as they did, even if we you know, can't bring about reformations, even if we don't have their particular gifts, we do have certain gifts the Lord has given us, and we need to be using those uh, for His glory. So... That's what we're looking at this morning and this evening. This Wednesday, we're going to be discussing the book of Second Chronicles. Um, the books that we're going to be reading for December are listed here. Uh, also, I want to remind you about the, uh, the thank offering. Uh, I keep forgetting week to week to um, say something about it, but if you would like to contribute, there is information about it at the, on the, the front table. There's also an envelope you can use uh, if you want to make a contribution. And then lastly, the, um, we decided, the, you know, I asked the session if we could have permission to return to having at least a monthly fellowship meal. And so if you're interested, we do have a sign-up sheet. Okay, there's a sign-up sheet in the back um, counter, the window opening there. So uh, perhaps, well, are you interested in having a fellowship meal? Would you attend if we, if we did? Anybody not want to? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So first first Sunday of the month, and uh, the sign-up sheet is there, so we make sure that we don't all bring desserts and <laughs> not have anything nourishing to eat. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. Uh, I think that was pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. Except to remind us all that we do need to be in prayer for uh, Paul's family. They have COVID. Uh, Mike Winther, who's still struggling. I wish they would put more information on that caring bridge, you know. Uh, he's, I guess, still on the ventilator. They're still trying to work him off. Anything new? Okay. 
Uh, I understand Ed Nicolay is still on the ventilator, and that's not good. Um, not good. The longer you stay on the ventilator, the, the worse it is for your, your whole body. Um, so we really need to pray for them that the Lord might have mercy on them. Okay, then let's, um, let's focus on what we're looking at this morning. Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25. The author to the Hebrews writes, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's a reason, there's several reasons why the Lord wants us to get together, uh, to assemble together, particularly on, on His day, uh, not the least of which is to worship Him and to show Him how much we love Him and to give Him thanks, but also because we're called to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That's really what the Lord saved us for, is that we might uh, do good works, that we might serve Him, that we might, as we're going to see in our passage this morning, be eager uh, to serve Him. And this is something we all need to be encouraged in from time to time because we lose sight of what it is that the Lord saved us to do, what He called us to do. Well, let's, <clears throat> let's think about this for a moment as we bow and pray silently and ask the Lord's uh, grace and mercy as we worship Him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have again given us uh, another week of life and given us uh, this day, which uh, in the Old Testament was the last day of the week, uh, to remind the saints that they were heading towards that eternal rest. And now on the first day of the week to remind us that our Lord Jesus Christ has entered that rest for us. And because he has, he gives us also the grace and strength to be able to enter that rest through Him. We thank You that we will enter into a very real heaven at the end of our days because of what Jesus Christ has done. And Lord, we want to remember that this morning. We want to remember how, well, just the glorious future we have, how much we are indebted to You for giving us Your Son. And what it is, Lord, You have actually saved us for, why You left us in this world, why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing. Father, we pray, encourage us today. We understand again, Lord, well, help us to understand everything that we need to understand to be able to do this effectively. Father, be with us now as we set our hearts to worship you, as we would do uh, what it is that you have given to us to draw near to you, that we might be strengthened <clears throat> to be able to do what you call us to do in the world. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we're called to worship the Lord through Psalm 67, a psalm that reminds us again why the Lord blesses us, why He has actually saved us. It's that we might be His witness to the world. The psalmist writes, God, be gracious to us and bless us, and cause His face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples with righteousness or uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear Him. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we see uh, not just implied in this psalm, but explicitly stated that uh, all the nations uh, are going to praise You. They are all going to be glad and sing for joy. You are going to judge the peoples of the nations and guide them 
uh, on this earth, Lord, uh, and we know that this all comes about through the work of the kingdom that our Lord Jesus Christ brought and that exists now within our hearts. We are members of that kingdom. We pray, Lord, show us our part today. Remind us of our part, even, Lord, as you did Luther and Calvin, uh, how they labor tirelessly to advance the gospel. Father, help us, we pray, to do what we can in the situations in which we are, that we might too honor you in this way and show ourselves to be the children of God, to be like our Lord Jesus. Father, would you please be with us, encourage us, give us grace and bless, we pray, this time that we have to draw near to you through our prayers, through our singing, through your word and through the table. Lord, be with us, we pray. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's remain standing and begin by singing hymn 238. And it's really a meditation by Isaac Watts on the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, we're very familiar with it, my dear Redeemer and my Lord, where he starts by saying, you know, I read what my duty is in your word, but I see it actually lived out by Christ and that's what I want to be like. I want to be like him. And that's actually why Jesus came into the world, to make us like him. My dear Redeemer and my Lord, I read my due. the law appears drawn out in living characters <clears throat> such was your truth and such your zeal such deference to your father's will such love and meekness so divine I would transcribe and make them mine. Cold mountains and the midnight air witness the fervor of your prayer. The desert your temptations knew your conflict and your victory too. Be now my pattern, make me bear more of your gracious image here. Then God the judge shall own my name amongst the followers of the Lamb. Please be seated. Now, this morning I have just a few verses I want to read for our scripture reading from 1 Peter 4, verses 8 through 11. And again, it bears on what we're looking at um, this morning. just want to remind us um, maybe what we haven't thought of for a while, and that is that the Lord has given to each one of us uh, you know, certain natural gifts, but spiritual gifts as well. Each of us has at least one, and we are to use these gifts uh, in order to serve the Lord. It's, it's part of the talents that he's given to us that he wants us to invest in the kingdom of heaven. This is what um, Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 8. He says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. 
to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I think um, we know our Lord Jesus Christ certainly took what his Father had blessed him with and used it in this way, spoke the utterances of God, served in the strength God supplies and everything seeking to draw attention to him. Uh, again, this is really what the Christian life is all about. It's not just a set of beliefs, and it's not just coming to church. Certainly it is those, but there's more to it than that. Uh, the Lord has a particular work for us, even as he did for Calvin and Luther. They weren't unique. And we need, of course, to discover what that is, and we'll talk about that this morning, how we do discover it. But the thing we really want to point out or, or focus on is the eagerness that we should have, uh, what he calls uh, being zealous for good works, simply means being eager to serve the Lord in the way that he has called us to serve, where he has put us with the gifts he has given to us. So let's, as we think about that, respond by singing hymn 585, Take My Life and Let It Be. And um, this, again, is a prayer of consecration that um, when we sing, we ought to be um, directing it to the Lord and meaning, of course, what we say. We really want Him to take us and use us, to consecrate us, to set us apart for His service and for His glory. Everything that we have, we use for him. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee, swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee, filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for Thee, ever only all for Thee. Well, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, we, <clears throat> we do thank you for the many things that we're learning through the Reformation series, and it's always encouraging for us to see examples of real people, uh, not that the, those in the Bible weren't real or that Jesus wasn't real, but people that really loved you. They were just ordinary mortals. We know our Lord Jesus Christ was not only fully man, but also fully God, and was, was anointed with the Spirit above measure and was sinless. And sometimes, Lord, it, it well, not sometimes, it's always, it's, it's impossible for us to measure up to that, uh, that example that He's given us because it's a perfect example. But Father, we thank You for um, those whose uh, lives revealed that work. The Apostle Paul, Peter, and disciples, uh, others in Scripture. We thank you, Lord, for those outside the Bible as well in church history, uh, people that you use very powerfully that showed that they loved you, that showed that if we consecrate ourselves to you, that, that there are things that can be done uh, for your glory, sometimes very great things. And Lord, we would like to do great things. And if, even if we can't, we want to do what we can, what we can do for your glory, even as the, the widow, uh, when she was offering her, uh, well, her offerings to, to you in the temple, put in less than everyone else as far as the monetary value of her contribution. But Jesus said she put in more than all of them because she put in everything that she had. Lord, we, we know that you accept what we do according to what we have uh, and not uh, comparing us to those that have so much more in, in the way of giftedness, in the way of perhaps of natural energies, in the way even of financial, um, well, material goods. But Lord, you, uh, well, you, you measure us, the measure of our love, by what we actually sacrifice to you according to what we're able to do. And so we pray, Lord, that you would grant to us that the prayer that we just sang, that we would actually mean, because this is how we understand what Jesus said, that if we were to follow him, that we must die to ourselves, we must pick up our crosses. As he said to the rich young ruler, we have to be willing to part with everything that we have. It all has to be seen as that which belongs to you and the stewardship entrusted to us that we might use this stewardship for your glory. Father, we pray that you would please encourage us to do that, again, through the example that we have been seeing and the example we will see uh, this evening, but particularly through the example of Christ and through his word in which you call us actually to do these things. Father, we pray, may your name be glorified would you glorify your name through us, even as you did through Luther and Calvin and many others? Would you, Lord, bring praise and honor to your name? Would you make your name known through us? Help us, Lord, to be those witnesses that you desire for this world, that they might know that you, that you exist, that you are, and that you are what you say you are in your word. Father, again, encourage us, grant us grace, grant us your blessing. And Father, we do pray that you would not only grant us this blessing, we're only just a few people here this morning, but Father, bless your entire church. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, may your spirit descend upon us. May he fill us with holy love and zeal for your glory. Would you please, Father, then strengthen each one of us to do what it is that is our role, our particular part in this work. And Father, help us to make Jesus known. Now we realize that, um, that some people have more giftedness, some people are called to this work full time. But Lord, we also know that we are put in the particular situations that you've put us in because there are certain individuals that you want for us to reach, not the least of which are in our homes or our households or our extended families. Father, our neighborhoods, places in which we work, there are people we know, and we may be the only Christian in their life. So, Father, we pray, help us to make Jesus known to them. Help us, we pray, to love you so much that we want to tell others about you. Help us, we pray, to love you so much that 
we're willing to uh, own this, this responsibility, this duty that you've given to us, and help us, Lord, we pray, out of love to discharge this duty, uh, to, again, share the gospel, to give a reason for the hope that is within us. Father, we do pray that this apologetic series that we went through is not just becoming uh, further and further distant in our minds and that we've forgotten everything that we've learned, but help us, Lord, to use what we have acquired so that we would remember and become more skillful. And also, Lord, so that we might be useful. Strengthen our faith in the truth of these things and help us, Lord, to come across to other people as those who believe that these things are true, not just to be, <clears throat> in their estimation, Bible thumpers, because most people don't respect the Bible. They don't believe it's your word. They're not going to listen to it. But, Father, as we share these reasons why we believe you exist and why the Bible is your word, uh, Lord, we believe that these arguments are compelling. What R.C. Sproul said was true, that they are absolute proof of the truth of these things, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. Lord, help us, we pray, then to share these truths and help us to be those that spread the knowledge of God that become the lights that you desire us to be in this world. And our Lord, help us to be eager, particularly to do this, eager to serve, eager to use what you've given to us, share that knowledge, share that treasure with others, as well as the other things you've given us uh, to build up, Lord, your holy kingdom. Father, we do pray again, grant to us the things we need to do this, the knowledge, grant to us your spirit, grant to us strength and energy, help us to overcome our fears. Lord, if we're sick, help us to overcome that. If we're in sin, bring us to repentance and help us to do the right thing, the, the loving thing towards you and towards our neighbor. Father, we lift up to you those that are currently under the weather and uh, have very serious illness uh, in particular. We think of um, Mike Winther and Ed Nicolay, both who are on ventilators, and we know that that's not a good thing. We know the ventilator takes its toll on the body, weakens it over a period of time. It may give them oxygen and raise those oxygen levels temporarily, but the burden it places on the rest of the body just wears them out. They can only survive for so long on it. We pray, Father, you would strengthen them and raise them up and grant them healing. We pray you would be with, with Paul and his family. Grant to them also, Lord, healing and strength. Be with each one of us, Father. Be with each of us in our needs, whatever those needs may be. Be with our brothers and sisters that we haven't seen in attendance here for a long time. And, Lord, whatever it is that's preventing them from coming, we ask that you would Grant that, well, you might heal them, help them to overcome these things, provide for them the things they need so that they may come and honor you as you call them to do from Lord's Day to Lord's Day so that they may honor you with their whole lives uh, during the week, serving you eagerly, worshiping you eagerly. Lord, help us all, we pray, to do these things. Father, again, we most humbly ask for your mercy upon our loved ones, who do not know you, particularly our children, that you would have mercy on their souls. Help us to remember, yes, they have heard the gospel. Uh, they do need your Holy Spirit. But it does appear from Scripture, though there are exceptions, that most often you work by your Holy Spirit while the word is being shared, and not necessarily after, years after, maybe decades after, which it does happen on occasion because you are sovereign. Father, help us, we pray, to can, can be uh, constant in prayer and help us to continue to share. And Lord, we know that um, uh, those, our children don't like to hear it, but Father, we pray, help us to share it anyway because we know that as long as, long as this, well, as long as they don't know you, there's, they're, they're in great danger and they certainly are dishonoring to you and that's the most important thing is that they be turned from that but there's also a barrier between them and us, and we'll never be able to really embrace one another as we would like to um, until we actually all know you. Father, we pray, grant again this mercy. Again, Father, we pray, would you forgive us? Forgive us of all of our sins. Thank you, Lord, for taking away the, the mountain of debt, the infinite debt 
that we owe to you. Help us to be willing to forgive the, the very small uh, debts uh, that others have uh, uh, towards us. Father, help us to forgive them. And Father, we'll praise you. And Lord, again, we pray, would you help us to overcome everything that stands in our way? Help us to put off every unloving thing that we do, every sinful thing. Help us, we pray, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant to us that we may overcome all evil in your power and the strength of your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that you would please grant these mercies because, Lord, again, what's at stake here is your kingdom. Would you advance your holy kingdom? Father, would you uh, use your infinite power so to do in our hearts and the hearts of your people that the kingdom may advance? And would you glorify your holy name? through these things. And Lord, lastly, I just pray that the things we just prayed, that we would truly, honestly desire, that we'd want these things to, to come to pass and so would invest ourselves in order that they might. Father, help us, we pray. Be with us now, we ask, and we'll thank you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, <clears throat> our passage this morning is also a very, very brief passage from the letter of Paul to Titus, um, and uh, really just want to focus on one verse, and I think you'll get the point when I read it, but I'd like to read just uh, a few verses leading, leading up to it, so Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. through verse 14. Paul writes to Titus, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and, and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Actually, you might want to say that everything that uh, the Lord has done to redeem us to himself and gift us and everything is for this specific purpose that we might be zealous for good deeds. And the word zealous, maybe we hear that word a lot and we, we just need to think about what it means. It's just excited, eager, wanting, you know, to do, uh, strongly desiring to do uh, what, what is good, what is right, what, what the Lord calls us to do, to, to serve. So that's why I entitled this Eager to Serve, and I think that's what we see in the lives of the Reformers, isn't it? That they were eager to serve. They, they didn't have uh, somebody breathing down their neck, so to speak, in order to get them to to do what it is they did. They were self-motivated. Uh, we say motivated by the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit works within their hearts to give them a love for the Lord and a desire to give themselves in the way that we just sang uh, this, this hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, because that really is what the Lord desires from us. So that's what I'd like for us to consider this morning. Now, as you know, today we're continuing to look at the Reformation, the revival, that God sent in the 16th century that brought the church back to the Bible and back to the biblical gospel, which the Lord alone uses to transform lives. And as I was thinking about the work the Lord did in those days, I was thinking about the state of the church today, uh, that this is something that we need the Lord to do again if we want to see Him glorified, as, as John Owen, I think, in one of these Quotes, I think I, I may, maybe I didn't put it in the bulletin I thought I had, but John Owen points out, you know, the Lord has many, many servants, but little service in the world. And that was true even during the days of, of the Puritans. Many who are professing to know the Lord and to love Him, but very little being done in His name. And when I, when I talk about the things that, that we need to think about doing, uh, really what we need to do is, is just to be the witnesses He calls us to be in the places He's put us. I'm not talking about we all need to go to the mission field or we all need to go do this or that. 
But we all just simply need to be faithful to witness, to be his witnesses. That's probably the main thing. You know, the gospel has been largely lost in today's popular Christianity, broad evangelicalism. You probably, if you, if you watched uh, maybe a sermon in another church, you, you see that oftentimes they turn out to be nothing more than just self-help talks. And the worship has become more of, of an entertainment sort of a thing meant to entice people to come because the interest is uh, to build big churches. Uh, Simon Chase, who uh, you know is uh, the pastor of Gillingham uh, Baptist Church, they're, I think they're having their evening service while we're having our morning. We kind of keep in touch. And he was talking about an association that, that he has in his neck of the woods where a bunch of Reformed pastors get together and they talk about you know, various issues in the Bible, and they encourage one another to, to do the Lord's work. And he asked if there was anything like that around here. And I remember that there was a ministerial association uh, that uh, would get together. And uh, I asked Paul Trike, who was the pastor of the RCUS, um, might still be, I think he might have come out of retirement to pastor that church, uh, if he ever joined with it and you know, went to those meetings, and he said that he did, but he stopped going because he said everything they wanted to do was something that he couldn't in good conscience do. Yeah, they were just going a different direction. It, it's not, you know, it's, like I say, it's just, it's become a, 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 a race. Back, back uh, actually, when we first came here years ago, it was a race to see who could build the biggest church. You know, what, what gimmicks are you using to get more people? And, and that's kind of what the subject was. And uh, even a church in Modesto that was a cult that happened to be growing. They were interested in what those people were doing uh, to see if they could get their churches to grow as well. Well, but the point is that it's become entertainment driven to try to attract people. God is no longer seen as he should be seen, the one that we are to treat as holy, the one we are to serve in holiness. But rather he exists, as I, we heard, I think, um, I think it was Ferguson who said, that he exists simply to serve us rather than for us to serve him. Perhaps, I forget whether it was Godfrey or Sproul or Ferguson. But R.C. Sproul writes this in an article that he has well, that was posted on Ligonier's website. He says, the modern movement of worship is designed to break down barriers between man and God, to remove the veil, as it were, from the fearsome holiness of God, which might cause us to tremble. It is designed to make us feel comfortable. The music we import into the church is music that we draw from the world of entertainment in the secular arena. I heard one theologian say recently that he was not only pleased with this innovative style of worship and music, but thought that what the church needs today is music that is even more funky. When we hear clergy and theologians encourage the church to be more funky in worship, I fear that the church has lost its identity. Well, certainly I think we'd have to recognize that is largely the case. But, you know, when you have a church that is geared in this direction to have messages that make people feel good and uh, worship that is entertaining, it, it creates another problem, and that is, you know, churches with a weak understanding of the gospel, and I mean the gospel more broadly. It produces weak Christians, okay, or maybe no Christians at all. When the message is compromised, so is its power to transform lives. You know, the people of God need to hear the truth of God in order that they might become what God intends for us to become. Now, that didn't happen with the Reformers, okay. They got the gospel right. They understood what the Lord was calling us to do, and in getting the gospel right, they learned what it is that God desired of them. And they, for their part, because their lives had been transformed by the Spirit of God, were eager to do it. They realized this is why the Lord saved them, and this is what He called them to. Now, I'd like to look at just a few things. I want us to consider that, that really what we see in them is the end product of what the Lord desires in us, that everything He does are so many steps leading up to this, that we might be where He wants us to be and that we might eagerly serve Him in that place. Now, if the Reformation teaches us anything, it certainly teaches us that we didn't come to the Lord on our own. 
the Lord brought us to himself. We know he did that for Luther. We've been looking at the history of Luther. Remember, Luther was returning to the university. His father had sent him to law school, wanted him to become a lawyer. But on his way there, the Lord sent the, the thunderstorm that has you know, various interpretations of why it affected Luther the way it did, but the end product was it compelled him to go into the Augustinian monastery where, through an intense study of the scriptures, the Spirit opened his mind to understand the gospel and his heart to receive it. Now, this evening we're going to see that he did something similar for Calvin. Calvin was also sent by his father to the university to become a lawyer because his father saw that he was a talented young man. But after his father died, uh, Calvin also changed direction, but not to go to the ministry. He became a literary scholar. So he had a humanist education, studied Greek, Hebrew, Latin, and so forth. But when he made his first attempt to try to make a name for himself by editing a, 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 te a classical text, and uh, it didn't fly so well. Not too many people were interested in it. Uh, the Lord suddenly broke in through the gospel and changed his heart. Now, we need to understand God is the one who sovereignly brings us to himself. When we were not looking for him, he was looking for us, and he found us. Now, the Lord brought us to himself. We need to understand not just to rescue us and to bring us into his family and make us his sons and daughters and give to us a glorious future. All those things are true but also because the Lord had a particular work for us to do. We need to understand that everything that goes into making us and saving us and gifting us is for a specific reason. Now, we saw how the Lord gave Luther certain abilities. He's a very naturally gifted guy, very intelligent, had a keen mind, had a great deal of natural energy. The Lord made sure that he had an education. It wasn't by accident that he sent him to law school. Law school helped him to think more logically. And in the monastery, of course, and the university, that helped him to think more biblically as he was focused on his studies. And the Lord gave Luther spiritual gifts, one that he gives to all of us if we are able to appropriate it, and that is zeal for his glory. But the other was the ability to understand his truth, and to communicate it in a specific way. Remember how Godfrey called Luther an occasional theologian because he had the ability to deal with the important topics of the day in a very effective and powerful way. You know, Calvin, as he reflects on Luther, says that God made Luther what he needed to be in order to bring about this reformation, these things that we see sometimes as flaws and Luther's character, and he had flaws, were actually strengths that sometimes were misdirected, but, but these were things he needed in order to do what the Lord had called him to do. God had given him the gifts to do that. And we're also going to see that God endowed Calvin with intelligence, natural energy, gave him a humanist education, as I said, in the languages, very important, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, gave him the ability to understand and communicate his truth. Only in this case, God blessed Calvin with a different kind of mind that wasn't just exploding out in every direction trying to deal with various topics, but he gave him an organized mind. He gave him the ability to see how all the parts fit into a systematic whole so that Calvin would write the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which was considered the systematic theology of the Reformation and perhaps the most widely read and most famous in all of church history. Now, God gave them particular gifts for a particular purpose, and we need to recognize that the Lord has done the same thing for us. Now, we may not have the mind of a Calvin or Luther, we may not have their energy, we may not have their ability to understand or communicate truth, but he has given to each of us natural gifts and to each of us at least one spiritual gift. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. 
If service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. By the way, all of these are, are very, very important. Now, Dr. Piper, some of you may know him or have heard of him, former president now because he's, he's retired and somebody else has taken the reins of Greenville Presbyterian Seminary. Uh, sees this as a list of the non-charismatic gifts that continue after the charismata, the, what we consider to be the spiritual gifts, uh, the, the ones that are the supernatural ones, have ceased. And so when you look at this list, you see, well, the gift of prophecy, how can that be you know, just an ordinary gift that continues? Well, we need to understand that he saw this and the Puritans saw that particular gift as one that not only had to do with foretelling the future, but it also had to do with, with foretelling God's will or, or speaking or declaring his will. As a matter of fact, one of the Puritans by the name of William Perkins, who's considered the father of Puritanism, wrote a book called The Art of Prophesying. It's not the kind of book that the modern charismatic movement would read to see how they can, you know, uh, foretell the future or, again, speak from God, just sort of ad lib. But it was a book on how to prepare and deliver sermons because that is how the Puritans understood the gift of prophecy. Certain elements missing, but it still continues. Well, these other gifts continue as well. And God has given us, again, natural and spiritual gifts because he has a particular work for us to do. Now, what that work is, we have to learn through his guidance, what we would call his providential guidance. Now, again, we know that you know, Luther, he didn't know he was going to become the leader of the Reformation, but the Lord led him there step by step, again, sending the storm, giving him that concern to direct him to the monastery, then bringing Tetzel into Germany with his outlandish claims for indulgences that he might provoke Luther to write these 95 theses questioning that abuse. Then moving on Schaupitz, who was the, the prior of that uh, monastery, to send him to Rome, not thinking what would happen would happen, but Luther there saw the abuses of the Roman system and then to the university in order to immerse himself in the scriptures in order that he might reveal his son to him through the gospel, and then bringing him into debate with John Eck, who convinced Luther at that particular um, debate in, in uh, Leipzig that if he was actually going to bring the gospel to Germany, he would first have to be willing to pay the price. He would have to be willing to die. So this is how God led him to his role as a reformer. And tonight we're going to see he did the same thing for Calvin. Now Calvin, you know, it's interesting. He, he just wanted to live the quiet life of a scholar. This was after he was converted, okay, after his disappointment with his attempt at uh, becoming a great literary scholar. Uh, he then thought he would serve the Lord. He wrote the Institutes uh, wanting to contribute to the Reformation, but he just wanted to live a quiet life, a quiet life of a scholar in Strasbourg. But when war seemed imminent, he was traveling from France, between Germany and France, he decided to take a detour around the front by going through Geneva. <laughs> and it was there that William Farrell, who knew about Calvin and recognized his gifts and knew that he was the man to lead the Reformation there, um, that when Calvin told him that he was only interested in study, Farrell told him, God would curse his efforts if in her time of need, Calvin turned his back on the church. Well, in these words of William Farrell, Calvin heard God's voice and he decided to stay. Now, we're going to find out that he didn't stay, you know, it wasn't a permanent residence at that time. He, he was kicked out and then they brought him back. But we have to say that this bringing him to Geneva really changed the course of, of history for the Reformation, because this is what God made Calvin to do. Now, we need to uh, remember as well that even though we may not have such a prominent place in, in history, that God has also providentially led each one of us to where we are right now. 
You know, what he said to Jeremiah when he was calling him to be a prophet also applies to us. He says in Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, we may not necessarily be a prophet to the nations, but we are ambassadors for Christ. Before the Lord formed us in our mother's womb, so many decades ago for most of us here, he knew us and set us apart for a particular work that he had for us to do, not the least of which that we too might be ambassadors to bring the gospel to those around us. Let me just remind you that <clears throat> throughout church history, historians have understood that the majority of people who have come to faith in Christ have not come to that faith by these high-profile evangelists preaching the gospel. That might be where the deal, as it were, was, was made, so to speak, where those people may have actually come to faith in Christ, but they did discover that, that the people who did, the vast majority of them, had been witnessed to by friends and neighbors, family members who knew the Lord Jesus Christ and who had been sharing it with them for years. In other words, it's that personal contact that is the most important. And that's really what the Lord has made us to do. That's where, why He's placed us where He has, why He's given us the families that we have, so that we might be that witness to them, that we might serve Him. But the last point is this, that having brought us to where we now are, He now calls us to use all that He has given us to serve Him in this, in this work and to do it eagerly. And I think that's the point of what Paul is saying in our passage in Titus 2.14. Jesus gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. And again, eager to serve. He saved us, gifted us, directed us to a place of service, and now we are eagerly to serve him. Now, again, there's no question that's what he did with Luther. Remember, Luther poured all of his energies into promoting the Reformation. The Roman church was amazed at how much he was able to produce in a literary form so quickly. He became the driving force of the Reformation in Germany. The same was true of Calvin, and we're going to hear about some of his accomplishments this evening. As I told you, Calvin wrote the first edition of the Institutes when he was still in his 20s. He was quite a gifted young man. And by the way, it's not the two volumes that it is currently today. It went through several editions. He kept enlarging it, but um, it was still substantial. It caused Philip Melanchthon to call Calvin the theologian of the Reformation. It also compelled William Farrell to, to speak to him as he did, to seek him out that he might stay in Geneva and do what needed to be done. As uh, Godfrey is going to point out this evening as well, that Farrell was one of those rare individuals who seemed to understand what his limitations were. And he knew that even though he could persuade, and he certainly persuaded Calvin, he didn't have the leadership skills and the organizational skills and the systematic mind that, that Calvin had. And he knew that Geneva needed Calvin. So Calvin's gifts drew, drew out all this attention. But he not only wrote the Institutes, he also wrote several treatises on a variety of theological topics. He wrote 50 volumes of commentaries on various books of the Bible, 35 volumes of letters, preached over 2,500 sermons. Actually, the number of times he preached, I'm surprised it's actually such a small number, but um, I mean, he, he preached virtually every day of the week. He was an advisor and counselor theologically and personally to many. He established two schools, a college in which working and middle-class boys could receive a uh, traditional, classical, and literary education that would allow them to move from that position to better professional jobs in commerce and law, and an academy for more advanced studies in law, medicine, and pastoral studies, which eventually became the University of Geneva. Now, we need to think about this. Um, they, were, they were called, they were saved, they, they were gifted naturally and spiritually. But we need to understand if they hadn't used those gifts that God had given to them, they would never have been able to accomplish what they did. 
But they were able to do this because they both were eager to give all that they had to Christ. And really, Paul is telling us this is what the Lord has saved us, He's gifted us, He's made us to do. This is what He wants us to do. And we need to be reminded from time to time. We know we're supposed to be this way. But we need to kind of examine how our lives are going and see whether that eagerness is actually there. Remember that the Christian life isn't just simply pursuing knowledge all the time and understanding our position in Christ. That is very important. But the, the, the actual product is supposed to be the work, the service we render to Him, being His witnesses. And we are to do this again, not out of a legalistic tendency to think that somehow I have to earn His favor, somehow I have to justify myself, which is how the Roman church encourages their people to seek justification. But He wants us to do it out of thankfulness for His mercy and in the power of His Holy Spirit, which is the power of love. Love, affection is a very powerful thing, the most powerful force in the universe. And in this, out of this love, He wants us to be eager to use the gifts He's given us in the places that He's put us to advance His kingdom through the gospel. Now again, the Lord doesn't expect us to do what Luther and Calvin did because we don't have their gifts, we don't have their callings, but He does expect us to do what we can do with the gifts and the callings He's given us. Now, I told you at the beginning, we need, we need a reformation, we need a revival. Uh, we need it here, personally, within our own lives, the church as a whole. This, what I'm talking about here, what Paul is talking about here, really stands in stark contrast to what most professing Christians appear to believe today if we were to observe their lives. I think most Christians think that if, that if, if they just simply accept the Bible as being true and pray to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, that they've really done all that God expects, they're on their way to heaven, all is fine. And if they happen to go the extra step and are faithfully, you know, faithful in their attendance in His worship, that they've actually become, you know, spiritually mature. That that's like, that's like a, a next step. I don't really need to do that, but, but I will do that. And then if they go so far as to share their faith with others, you know, to be witnesses, then they've entered into that special category of super saint. Now, we know the truth from the Scripture is it's not enough simply to believe the Bible because the devils believe and they tremble, James tells us. Attending church is not an indication of spiritual maturity. It's really the most basic first step of our duty uh, not to worship the Lord publicly, as, as we are reminded in our meditation, is to disobey Him unless we are physically unable to attend. And again, COVID creates a lot of complications in that matter, but our desire should be to be here. And sharing our faith doesn't make us super saints. It, it's just another part of our duty, our most basic duty, to make the Lord known, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us, a duty which should be a joy for us to do because we love the Lord. So our Lord calls us really to take the stewardship that He's entrusted to us seriously he wants us to be eager to use our natural and spiritual gifts and resources in the places that He's put us to advance His kingdom, even as He did through Luther and Calvin. And again, let's just be reminded that this zeal, this love, this eagerness that I'm talking about, it doesn't come automatically. This is something we have to work for. We actually have to put out effort to, to obtain. We're only going to find this kind of zeal in Christ. It only comes from an intense love for Him, but that love for Him only comes from drawing near to Him. And again, I believe it was Ferguson that reminded us that the means of grace are not so many ways in which we get like a quantity of grace or an infusion of the Holy Spirit and that that's what we're after uh, <clears throat> so that we can, I don't know, feel differently, maybe more zealous uh, for the Lord, feel like we love Him more. <clears throat> but there really means of drawing near to Him, to drawing closer in our fellowship with Him. That's why we worship. That's why we're here. That's why we read the Word. That's why we have messages from the Word where we expand on this through Scripture and actually apply it 
That's why we pray. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's why we need to be together to fellowship so we can stimulate one another to love and good deeds. The Lord knows that we're a body and we're a family. We need to be together. Now, the reason the kingdom of heaven isn't advancing as it should is because there are so few, I think, of professing Christians who are actually doing this, who are actually drawing near to the Lord. Think of it in these terms. You know, we have a smoldering ember of a coal that uh, is going to get weaker and weaker unless we come to the altar, as it were, to that hearth, and we fire that coal back up by drawing near to the Lord. That's what all this is about, drawing near to Him so that we can glow with, with a fervent kind of affection. That makes a huge difference in the way that we live. And again, the kingdom languishes because so few are pursuing this. Instead, they're pursuing the very things that Paul says the Lord redeemed us from, which is you know, having to do with, a, with the worldly desires. You know, the world is like a siren that just draws us away. Now, it is true that the new birth is something that God does sovereignly by Himself, but we've got to remember that sanctification, drawing near to God, is something that we have to be engaged in. And we are sanctified. We are strengthened in our faith and in our love as we draw near to Him. So let's, according to the words of the Apostle, through our Lord Jesus Christ, pursue the zeal that He wants from us so that we might more faithfully do and eagerly do what the Lord has saved us to do, gifted us to do, and put us in specific places to do. Well, let's, let's pray, shall we? Let's uh, pray silently and then we'll all close with an audible prayer.